Hatırlatın. Okay, so welcome to our uh, third day of the webinar series. Uh, can begin by asking if uh, there are any comments or questions or concerns from the last two webinars. Okay, so if there aren't any comments, we can proceed. My proposal for today is to uh, simply uh, run two 40 minute sessions with a 20 minute break in between. And uh, the first session I'd like to focus on uh, meta analysis. And in the second session, on uh, grading of information to understand uh, and interpret the evidence considering its uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, I also believe given that it is Friday, maybe two sessions will be appreciated better by colleagues who have joined uh, the webinar. So with this, uh, Brief description for today, we can proceed to my slide set. And uh, the first session will be concerning uh, data synthesis. And before we jump into data synthesis or, stat or statistical synthesis, uh, we should just remind ourselves that uh, we are dealing with uh, systematic reviews where we begin in the first step by framing question in the second step by identifying all the literature in the third step uh, extracting data including data concerning study quality and now in front of us is the question of how to present the information we have uh, collected so the first thing about uh, data synthesis is that the large majority of information we have collected needs to be pre presented in form of uh, tables. So here uh, we can see a typical table of study quality, which we also saw in the last uh, webinar session. Basically the studies all have to be put in rows and then something said about them in columns. So this is the typical table structure uh, for table of any kind used in, in uh, meta-analysis, used in a systematic review or meta-analysis paper. And typically also in the last column, we tend to say something that summarizes uh, stuff written in the middle uh, columns. So in this particular table, for example, there is a description of the quality of studies. And uh, we can see here something about selection bias, measurement and performance bias, and attrition bias, and then a total score. Um, and then, if you are engaged in a review that has 70, 80, 90, 100, 200 studies, you can see that a table will not fit on one page. And in this situation, it's common to turn to summarizing this information in form of uh, graphics. Sorry, Khaled, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, but we're not able to see your screen. And there's some issue just, with screen sharing. Okay, we'll 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 re we'll reintroduce the screen.
Yes, we can see it now. Thank you. Okay, Ap apologies to your colleagues for having missed this part. Uh, and uh, apologies also that I miss your message in the chat. So I was highlighting that tabulation is the first step and uh, tabulation is, uh, is typically in the manner that studies in rows identify their identification, uh, identifier in the first column and some summary of whatever is being said about these studies in the last column and details in the columns in between. And here concerning study quality, we have various individual items described and then totaled in the end. And um, when you have 70, 80, 90, 100 plus studies, you can see that this information cannot fit on a page. So here we turn to summarizing information in form of graphs. And this is a typical graph used um, when summarizing large number of studies. So let's just look at some advice as to how best to prepare graphs. So here is a paper that gives guidance on what are the key principles for graph construction. So the first most important thing about graph is the caption. The graph need to be able to stand alone. So you need to describe it in as much detail as necessary so that it can be understood without the need for reading the text. Also remember that uh, on the first day I said to you that uh, the editor will probably read the title and the abstract and introduction, will not necessarily read the whole paper, but then after abstract and introduction, they will probably jump to looking at graphs and tables. So keep the possibility in mind that they are looking at your graphs and tables without having the benefit of reading the text. So they need to be able to understand everything that you want to convey through the graph uh, without, at one glance, without the need for them to have to read through the text to understand it. So the key thing is you need to define all the data symbols and abbreviations. Uh, ex it should be self-explanatory. And here is a specific advice that three-dimensional graphs should be avoided. In, and, and this advice is based on uh, the published science, which shows that three-dimensional graphs are not easily understood by human beings. So a graph should be standalone, avoid and spell out all the abbreviations. For example, in this graph of a systematic review, you can see that Randomized trials are spelled out in short form with RCT so that when the word RCT is used again, it can be readily seen within the graph as to what this means. Okay, so now we turn to another type of graph, which is summarizing a large number of studies where the only result you have is whether the finding is positive or the finding is negative. For example, in health economic evaluations, you may often find results presented as effectiveness is better, same or poorer. So this type of information can be summarized again in form of graphs. You can throw in some color coding if you wish. And you can state for each category of finding, the cost is high, the outcome is poorer, there are zero studies. On the other hand, uh, the cost is low and the outcome is better. Uh, and then you can use the color coding green. So nowadays, because journals are happy to publish graphs with color, take advantage of it and use it in a manner that helps with interpretation. So after some, uh, some things said about graphs and tables, we turn to 
meta-analysis. So for meta-analysis, uh, I'd like to take you back to how we calculate an effect size just so that it's all fresh in our minds. The first thing to remember is that your constructed research question is captured in a two by two table in this way. So the participants are right here uh, in the last column of the two by two table. The intervention and outcome are in the rows and uh, in intervention and control are in the rows and the outcome are in the columns. So each element of uh, your research question shared in this description of uh, the data. And then this data described in this way, and we take that example of a study with 200 people who were divided into two groups of 100 each, and the outcome was present amongst 10 in the control group and amongst 25 in the intervention group. And the re relative risk was calculated here as being 2.5. So I hope you can see that a single number, 2.5, captures virtually everything that you first imagined at the time of framing your question. <clears throat> and if the calculation is uh, by another effect measure called odds ratio, using the same data, this information is captured by a number calculated from the same data set, but it's a higher number, 3.0 instead of 2.5. So the effect measure you choose impacts on the number that you present in your paper. So at this stage, I'd just like to stop to offer you a chance to ask me any questions about the relationship of the research question to the two by two table, and then to the effect measure that emerges from it. And as soon as we are comfortable with this calculation, we can then move on to discuss what is a meta analysis. Okay, so with this background described, uh, we move on to, you will recall that the point estimate of effect that uh, we observed as being the calculation carried out in the previous slide is represented by uh, a dot or a box or uh, a square in the middle and the size of the study captured by confidence interval uh, is described by a line, a horizontal line that runs across the estimate of effect. And, uh, and the typical way of presenting studies, taking the same concept as we presented in the tables, that on the left-hand side, we have the studies described. And on the right-hand side, we have the result described. And the result can also be described graphically. And this graphic description on a scale, uh, where at the bottom, you can see the value one represents no effect. Um, can be used to describe the result of each individual study 
uh, with a box. The values less than the values less than one on the left hand side show uh, 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 that the intervention is not effective. It is in fact possibly harmful, and on the right hand side it shows that uh, uh, it is effective or beneficial to the patient compared to control. So any questions about plotting of this information graphically uh, concerning the results of the individual studies? Okay, uh, yeah. on the first day we had a question presented to us where the intervention was a new type of fluoride and uh, compared to standard treatment, the outcome of interest was caries. Do you think if caries is the outcome measure, a value more than one will be considered beneficial or harmful? Probably harmful. Uh, why do you say that? Le explain, explain, explain a bit more about that. Uh, we are um, looking at the outcome as carious arrest or no new carious, which would be the benefit of the treatment. Okay, so if you were to measure this as no new carries. Uh, in this case, a value more than one will show benefit. But if you were to measure the outcome as the percentage of carries, then a value less than one would be beneficial. So what I'm trying to explain here is that when the value is greater than one, it shows that the thing you are measuring as outcome has a higher rate compared to control. So if it was caries that you measured and you discovered that it had a higher rate compared to control with the new fluoride, then obviously a value more than one is suggesting the possibility of harm from the new intervention. Does that make sense? Okay, so Urska and Anna both say that it does make sense. Uh, Hotchka too. A any, other, uh, any other examples you would like to put forward just so we can understand how relative risk is calculated uh, and taken forward in meta-analysis? Um, we, can, we can bring that up now or later as you wish. So once we have all these individual results available to us, the next thing we do is we put all this information into a statistical software package. RevMan is one that you might be using if you're doing a Cochrane review, but Stata R and virtually all other, uh, all other both commercial and freely available software offer you the option to perform a meta-analysis uh, using this data from individual studies. And what you get from the output is what we are going to look at next. 
So basically, at the bottom of these individual results, you get what is described as a diamond. And in this diamond, the middle point, the thickest point is the point estimate of the summary effect. And the length of the diamond from one side to the other is the confidence interval of the summary effect. So what happens in a meta-analysis is that all these individual points, including those below one, including those very close to one, including those much greater than one, are all put together into a single summary point, which in this case is, happens to be 1.4, a little bit above one. And then all the confidence intervals are combined together to produce a summary confidence interval. And you can see that this length of the diamond from one end to the other, from one side to the other side, is much shorter than the length of any of the individual studies. So now you can, you can imagine that what is meta-analysis? Can somebody try to explain in words what I have just uh, described with this diagram. So just for me to double check that you, that I have conveyed what I wanted to convey correctly. Please go ahead, be brave. Uh, Anna, might you attempt to explain? Okay, well, nobody's coming forward. In this case, I'll just go back and give a little summary of where we are. Uh, the starting point of a meta-analysis, which is this diamond at the bottom of a forest plot, is the construction of the summarization of the data collected to address your question. Uh, when the data concerning outcome in your question are in the form of present or absent, and you have two groups, one of exposure to a new intervention and the other of exposure to a control treatment, then your question concerning your participants, intervention, comparison, and outcome can be summarized in a two by two table. From this two by two table, we can calculate an effect size. This effect size can be plotted in a forest plot. And the forest plot simply represents um, the range of results that are possible on the scale of your chosen effect size. So in case you have chosen relative risk, the value one will represent no effect. And in case the outcome is a positive desirable thing that you are trying to achieve, then the value more than one will demonstrate benefit. And these points from each of the studies that you identified through step two, and from which you extracted data in step three, 
then these points from each of these studies can be plotted uh, 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 in, in, in the space above the scale for the effect size. And then for each study, because the study size is different, you need to have an understanding of the uncertainty of the results. And this is obtained by calculating the confidence interval and plotting it across the point estimate as a horizontal line. If this line crosses the value one, this means that your result is not statistically significant. And if this horizontal line of confidence interval does not include the value one, then it means that your result is statistically significant. And uh, these individual results, the points and the confidence intervals are subjected through meta-analysis to production of a summary result. And the summary result is frequently presented as a diamond where the middle of the diamond represents the point estimate of the summary and the length from side to side represents the confidence interval of the summary. Okay, so as I was speaking, uh, Urska asks the question whether confidence gives us information about dispersion of data. Okay. What do you mean by dispersion of data? So look, in the example we have chosen, the data were a two by two table where people were either positive for an outcome or negative for an outcome in their allocated group, either in intervention or in the control. In this context, what do you mean by data dispersion? Okay. Uh, uh, so this is a sorry, term. I wasn't. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I wasn't very uh, attention. I haven't paid attention on it. There, there are just two results, yes or not. Uh, so it could not be um, dispersion of data. Yes. Sorry. Okay. You are probably referring to continuous measurement, for example, pain on a scale or quality of life on a scale from zero to 100, something like that. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. So if you think about it, the point estimate of effect that we have calculated is also a measurement on a scale from zero to infinity. Did you follow that, Oscar? No, sorry. The relative risk or odds ratio is a measurement of the effect. Yes. And the scale of this measurement goes from zero to infinity. Okay. And the value one means that there is no effect. Yes. So your description of dispersion of data applied to the estimate of effect is in fact correct. Okay. Uh, what the confidence interval is doing here is telling you the possibility of range of results that are possible, the range of effect sizes that are possible around the mean effect size that has been calculated in the meta analysis. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. All right. So I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I think now you can see the difference between data and the result. So the data are the thing that are were in the two by two table where we had numbers. Uh, you had outcome present or absent according to whether you were present in the intervention group or the control group. Those numbers are the data from those numbers, we generated a result. 
that was the effect size. And the effect size has a dispersion around it, which depends largely on the sample size of the studies. And this dispersion is quite wide or is quite narrow, if depending on how many observations were there inside the data. So dispersion of data is captured by confidence interval uh, of the effect size, which I hope with this question and a more detailed explanation is now clearer. Another point to understand here is that all that meta-analysis is trying to achieve is a mathematical summary of the results of the individual studies. It's, it cannot do anything more or less than what the individual studies have managed to achieve within their own projects. Okay, now the next thing I want to touch upon is that the meta-analytic summary can be correct or incorrect representation Okay, Mitya has made a good point there. In the previous diagram, he has picked up that none of the studies are statistically significant and neither is the meta-analysis. Uh, Mitya, you want to say a few more words about what you wrote down in the chat? Uh, yes. Well, just at looking at the first plot, you can see that uh, none of those confidence intervals is uh, completely uh, on one side. So, as you said before, no study is really statistically significant. And I would suppose that the same is correct for the meta-analysis that is still just over the border on the left side. Yes, so in this meta-analysis, we can say that um, this, the, there is a small possibility that there could be less pregnancies in the intervention group. Do you see what I mean? The result of 1.4 means that there is a 40% possibility uh, that the rate of pregnancy will be higher with intervention compared to control. This is the value 1.4. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not, I don't agree exactly on that point because 1.4 doesn't mean that uh, uh, the average, uh, the calculated relative risk is 1.4 so if one has the intervention most likely it has 40 percent more uh, chances to get pregnant compared to the ones that don't get the intervention well that that is correct your description is correct on average it will be 40 percent yeah but on the extremes there is a 220 percent chance which is 2.18 Yep. or 218% chance that there'll be more pregnancies. But also there is a 10% chance, which is 0 0.9, uh, which is 0 0.1 less than one, that there may be more pregnancy in the control group. So do, you, do, do colleagues feel that you can understand what I just described? Mitya, you have uh, anything to add? Oh, thanks. Okay, so this is how we interpret the effect size now that we have the value available in front of us. And this result, because the value 0 0.9 goes just a little bit less than one, does not reach 
the 0.05 level of statistical significance that is typically used in statistical analyses. Now, I should tell you that although we use 0.05 of significance as the threshold for statistical significance, there is no real reason why it should be 0 0.05. Why couldn't it be 0 0.01 or 0 0.1? Not going to go in detail of this discussion, especially because you and I through this webinar are not going to change the tradition but I want you to keep in mind that the tradition that we use 0.05 or we use 95% confidence intervals is entirely a tradition. It does not have any objective or scientific basis. Because there is no fixed uh, criterion I prefer that when we look at a diamond, we don't just look at that it is crossing the value one or not. We should look at the whole range of result. So then we understand the result better. So I think we're going to stop at this stage. We come back in 20 minutes. And when we come back in 20 minutes, we'll look at how we understand the diamond a bit better than just uh, looking at what is the overall result and the range of the result. Thank you.